It's also, uh, it's not just Advent season. We are in our third day, fourth evening tonight of Hanukkah, for those who are celebrating Hanukkah as well. I'm lighting our candles. We're lighting our candles at home, which has been pretty cool to share a story in that. Pray some blessings as well. So some of you may or may not remember what Hanukkah represents. Um, a short song I listened to is like a festival of lights. But ultimately, it was like the rededication of the temple in the second century. And how they would light these candles, it, it was supposed to last several days. Um, but each candle, it was like a little jar, if you will, and it had olive oil in it and a little wick. And they would light this wick and it would burn through the olive oil and it, it was supposed to last one day. And there were supposed to be several of those. But the, the, the Greek people were oppressing the Israelites and they couldn't, and they, they were forcing them to celebrate what they celebrated. They wouldn't allow them to celebrate their things. Uh, as Israelites and so they only had one little little jar with a wick in it full of olive oil that's supposed to last one night so they lit that on the first night and it lasted eight nights it was a miracle it was unbelievable and so that's why today we celebrate eight nights of Hanukkah lighting uh, candles and whatnot so a little background there for us <clears throat> we are in the midst of, we have paused our Galatian series. We're going to start that in January again. We'll pick that up, and it's going to go January, February, March, and continue on through Easter. Um, and, uh, but today and the next couple weeks, we're going to go and continue to celebrate Advent. Last week, we celebrated uh, promise uh, and hope. We can place our hope in God's promises, especially the promise of the Messiah, and uh, today we celebrate uh, preparation and peace. Next week is joy and Christmas Eve, which will be a morning service for one hour, uh, will be love. So we'll look at that. And so we've been uh, enjoying, I've been enjoying Advent. I don't know about you guys, but uh, it's been awesome for me. Um, it's my hope to have some passages we can enjoy together and see a little differently. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in two main passages today. Uh, one is in Isaiah chapter 40, and the other passage is in Genesis chapter 6. So we'll start in Isaiah, and uh, <clears throat> then I'll, I'll, we'll move on from there. But once you're at page 547 in your yellow Bibles... It is Isaiah 40. We're going to start with verses 12 through, through 31. And if you uh, turn your attention, I think, sh yeah, you have your mic. Okay, great. Uh, Robin's going to read for us our passage today. Isaiah 40, verses 12 through 27. The Lord has no equal. Who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? Who is able to advise the spirit of the Lord? Who knows enough to give him advice or teach him? Has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does he need instruction about what is good? Did someone teach him what is right or show him the path of justice? No. For all the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. They are nothing more than dust on the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. All the wood in Lebanon's forest and all Lebanon's animals would not be enough to make a burnt offering worthy of our God. Wow. The nations of the world are worth nothing to him. In his eyes they count for less than nothing. Mere emptiness and froth. To whom can you compare God? What image can you find to resemble him? Can he be compared to an idol in f formed in a, can he be compared to an idol formed in a mold, overlaid with gold and decorated with silver chains? Or if people are too poor for that, they might at least choose wood that won't decay, 
and a skilled craftsman to carve an image that won't fall down. Haven't you heard? Have, don't you understand? Are you deaf to the words of God? The words he gave before the world began, are you so ignorant? God sits above the circle of the earth. The people below seem like grasshoppers to him. He spreads out the heavens like a curtain and makes his tent from them. He judges the great people of the world and brings them all to nothing. They hardly get started, barely take root when he blows on them and they wither. The wind carries them off like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Asks the Holy One. Look up into the heavens who created all the stars. He brings them out like an army one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. O oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? O oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strengths. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. As you hear the words that Robin shared and that I concluded in, what, what brings you peace? What part of those verses that were read bring you peace? Yeah, he's above all that. And then we get to verse 27. He says, oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? Like he knows, he's aware. And that gives me peace. Anybody else? All right. So um, thanks for sharing. Recently, my daughter wanted us to watch a movie, a suspenseful movie, uh, like one that you're like on... Uh, uh, what do they call it? Needles and pins? Pins and needles or something like that? Um, so, and then any sound might get you like, whoa, like that. One of those kinds of movies. And I don't watch those movies. I, I do like the Hallmark movies that I'm like warm and fuzzy and I start crying when that little teddy bear comes out or whatever it is. But anyways, so this, she watched this movie with her friend. It's called A, A Quiet Place. Is that right? So if you've watched the movie A Quiet Place, it, it, it's about, um, how do, it's crazy. It's, it's not quiet. Well, it's quiet because this girl's deaf, and then any sound that's made, these monsters come and eat and destroy whatever made that sound. So that's the type of movie it is. And so when you hear a sound, you get startled because these monsters will just kind of like come out of nowhere. And so my daughter watched this, and she said she was going to watch this. I was like, are you sure about that? And she did. She watched it with her friend, and she loved it. And she comes home, and she says, oh, Mom, Dad, we got to watch this movie. And we're like, are you sure? And so we're sitting here. She's already watched it, and I'm sure she got startled the first time she saw the movie. But after you see something once, you know the ending. You know what's going to happen when this person's in the bathtub over here, when they turn around the corner over here, or whatever that is, you know what's gonna happen. And so while we're watching the movie at our house, my daughter is sitting in the room and she's just kinda like, almost probably watching us like be like this, knowing what's gonna happen. And she's like, oh, this is gonna get them right here. This is gonna get them. And we, once again, we, you know, we jump <laughs> throughout the whole movie. That's what happened. And so I started thinking about that as we're talking about preparation. As we're talking about peace, those who are prepared 
have peace. Those who are not prepared, those who don't know what to expect, don't have peace. And as she was experiencing this movie, she had more peace knowing what was going on because she was prepared. And if you think about life, life is the same way. When we're not prepared for certain circumstances, when we're not prepared, if we're not anchored in the Lord, if we're not walking intimately with him and we experience something that just knocks us off our rocker, we don't have peace. I was doing lunch. I was having lunch with a guy this week and they said I was meeting with this person in my life. Um, so they, uh, let me back up. So I was having lunch. I hope this is clear. And the person I was having lunch with is a believer and they were sharing a dream with me. And in this dream, it was them and a person who does not have faith in their life. Are you tracking so far? So in this dream, so now we're in the dream, this person who has faith is walking with this person who does not have faith. And there, and there was this interpretation in this dream, but the person who didn't have faith did not have peace. They were all, they were both going through something. The house was kind of falling down but he had peace and he says I knew I had peace because I have a relationship with the Lord not just one and done I prayed and received Jesus a long time ago but he's actively pressing into God and a, an outcome of that was peace and as I think of our passage uh, over and over God is saying this is who I am this is who I am. Remember who I am, and you will take comfort. When we face the smaller things in life that mean nothing, but to us, it, our whole world is falling apart. Take comfort. God is near. I want us to dive into this passage um, in, in Genesis because it gives us a snapshot of the whole, our whole lives. If you think about the story of God, there's creation, there's rebellion, there's promise, there's redemption, there's kingdom, and there's recreation. So in layman's terms, God created things, things fell apart, and God promises he'll fix it. He brings about a fix, a solution, and then they live forever in a new creation with God. We are stuck in what seem of creation, rebellion, promise, redemption, uh, kingdom, and then recreation. Where are we at in the story of God? I heard many things. So creation happened. Rebellion happened. Now, we experience, you know, many little rebellions all the time. Um, but then we have a promise was given that there's going to be a birth of a son, which we prepare for his first coming, and that happened. That's Advent. Advent says now we prepare for his second coming. And so that's happened. Then we're in this place of this kingdom. We're living in this already but not quite yet kingdom experience. The scripture calls it the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, depending if you're in Matthew or Luke, right? It refers to it a little differently. And so that's the season we're in. And we have glimpses of rebellion. We have glimpses of promise. We have glimpses of, of those things. So this passage we're about to read is going to give us a snapshot of creation, rebellion, uh, promise of redemption, and kingdom and recreation. So I want to read this uh, and go through it and ask some questions and work through this passage. So now we turn to page seven in the Yellow Bibles. You have that, page seven. Genesis chapter six. <clears throat> it's a story. We'll start in verse nine. Story about a guy named Noah. <clears throat> or we can say it's an account about a guy named, a guy named Noah. Uh, this is the account of Noah and his family. <clears throat> Noah was a righteous man the only blameless person living on earth at the time. And he walked in close fellowship with God. Noah was the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
Verse 11. Now God saw the earth and had become corrupt and was filled with violence. God observed all this corruption in the world, for everyone on earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out along with the earth. Build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. Then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. Make the boat 400 feet lo- 450 feet long, seven, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. That's a very big boat. 450 feet long. Just to put that in perspective, uh, you know a football field? That's like uh, 300 feet. Uh, it's 100 yards, 300 feet. So add another 100 uh, feet from a football field. That's how long this, this arc is with this boat. Uh, let's see. Verse 16, leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around the boat. Put the door on the side and build three decks inside the boat, lower, middle, and upper. Verse 17, look. I'm about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die, but I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Several verses later, verse 22, it says, So Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. So in our passage, uh, in, in Genesis here with this story of the flood, this account of the flood with Noah. We see God, um, there's corruption, and then there is redemption, and there's a promise. You're going to be redeemed. You're going to be restored. You're going to be saved, if you will. And then recreation at the end. We didn't read this part, but they're supposed to repopulate the earth. And so in, in our passage, what did Noah do to prepare? Or for those who were rescued, um, what did they do to prepare? And what were they preparing for? He built a boat. Yep. He prepared by building a boat. How else did he prepare? He stayed in fellowship with God. Another way he prepared, he obeyed God. So in his preparation, he walked with God, he obeyed God, and he built this ark, this big boat. So he submitted to God. We can say that he submitted his life to God. So what does this look like today? What does it look like for one who says they have faith in God? What does it look like for them to prepare for Jesus to come back? What does a life of preparation look like today? To obey God. So what does obeying God look like? Okay. Fellowshipping him through the word, right? Connecting with God through the word. What else? Surrendering. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. What what else does it look like? These are all good. These are all right. Discipline. Discipline. Explain that. What does that mean? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's good. Anybody else? What does it look like to prepare today? Yeah. Right. So we're supposed to focus on God. How does one focus on God? Talk louder. So have an intimate relationship with him. Prayer. Connect with him in prayer. Talk to him. Study his word. Be in fellowship. 
Yeah. These aren't must do's. These aren't what saves us. But these are definitely healthy things to experience to love God and experience the outcome of peace in the midst of chaos. Uh, here and then back here. Stay out of the mall. <laughs> Stay out of the mall and turn off the news. Stay out of the mall and turn off the news. Yeah, if you want more peace, stay out of the mall and turn off the news. That's good. Hand here and then over here. So we go through this account with Noah and we see him obeying God. We see him believing in God. We see him trusting God. We see him preparing for what's to come. What was to come? A flood. Rain from the sky, which they haven't had yet. It normally just came from the earth. But now we have rain from the sky, rain from the earth, and a flood was taking place. And this one man and his family had peace. Why? Because they were prepared. Why? Because they walked with God. They knew he was and they trusted him. So they get on this boat and all chaos is breaking loose around them. The boat is probably rocking back and forth, but they trusted God. They were prepared. They believed. They walked and fellowshiped with the Lord. So peace, we want peace. God says, pray for peace. But I want to encourage you, don't just pray for peace but remind yourself about him who you're praying to. Look at what most of the chapter, you don't have to look now, but most of the chapter of Isaiah 40, we talk, take peace, take comfort, is who am I? Who is this God? Who is this God? No one's above him. No one's like him. Who is this God? Over and over. So if we want peace in our life, continue to press into him. And walk with him, get to know him, trust him to cover the things we're going through. And so Noah experienced peace. And so I would say there is peace for the anchored. For those who are anchored in God will experience the peace of God. We have the promise of the fruit of the Spirit. One of the pieces of the fruit of the Spirit is peace. It's the outcome of the Holy Spirit in us that we will experience so when life is chaotic, where am I with the Lord? If you have anxiety, if there's like craziness happening, if your heart's going, like where am I? Where have I been with God? How, what are my rhythms with God? Am I trusting in him? Life would look completely different if I was anchored in him and not placing my anchor somewhere else. Like think about, think about when we are in our most craziest state, when we're flustered, when we're this, if we were to ask the question, where am I putting my hope? Where's my anchor right now? Oh, it's in my work. I'm afraid of losing money. Or it's in my identity because I didn't perform well in this environment. Where is my anchor? If our anchor is in the Lord, we will experience the peace of the Lord. We don't have to strive for the peace. We don't have to try to be peaceful. Press into the Lord and you experience peace. Now let's flip back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40, back to Isaiah. There's only 11 verses we didn't cover yet. We're gonna cover 11 verses briefly. Isaiah chapter 40, so he, God has given him a word, this man Isaiah, and Isaiah is giving this word to God's people. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. A voice said, shout. I asked, what should I shout? Shout that people are like the grass 
Their beauty fades as quickly as the flowers in a field. The grass withers and the flowers fade beneath the breath of the Lord. And so it is with people. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountaintops, Shout it louder, O Jerusalem. Shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. (laughs) Yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So God's people can have peace. Two reasons, there's many reasons, but there's two reasons that pop up in these 11 verses that God's people can have peace. Verse 2. Why can God's people have peace? Share with me what's proclaimed in verse 2 that would give anyone peace. Exactly. The past power of the gospel. And in layman's terms, Jesus died for our sin, meaning we have been set free from the penalty of sin. Scripture says the penalty of sin is death. Jesus died for us. So our sins have been pardoned. I say our, all of those who place faith in Jesus. If you are part of that our this morning, then that, is, that belongs to you. But for those who have not, that doesn't belong to them. And so here, one of the reasons why we can have peace is because the past power of the gospel. Jesus has already died for our sins. That's in verse two. It says, yes, the Lord has punished, or one, one line before that, tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. They've experienced the punishment of their sins twice over, scripture says. But for those who follow Jesus, their sins have been placed on Christ. He has experienced it twice over on your behalf, on our behalf. And that's really good news. The second piece of good news is, uh, starts in verse six, but mentioned in verse nine, 10, and 11. A voice said, shout. I said, what am I supposed to shout? And they said, shout. I'm gonna go all the way down to the punchline. Your God is coming. Verse nine says, your God is coming. This is what we're supposed to shout. This is what we're supposed to be excited about. And all of this for them is looking forward. For us, it's looking backwards. Jesus came. Now, verse 10 says, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. Has that happened yet? No. Jesus didn't come to rule the first time. He came to be a servant among servants. He came to love. But here it says Jesus will come to rule. This is one reason why Jews today don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Because they believe the Messiah, as he comes, this will happen. And this hasn't happened. So I believe there's going to be a ton of Jews come to faith when Jesus comes back. Because this will happen. And they'll say, this is what we've been looking for. There's the Messiah. But for us, we understand that it's a two-part Messiah experience. It's a two-part coming here. Jesus came, he laid a foundation, and he says, I'll be back. I'm coming back. So also verse 10 and 11 hasn't happened. 
um, where he has, uh, he will feed the flock like shepherd, uh, like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother's sheep with their young. So these things are pointing to what we would refer to as the future power of the gospel. What has yet come with Jesus coming back. And so in this, as we proclaim this, there is a preparation throughout this passage in Isaiah 40. Isaiah says, prepare for the Lord. And we've talked about this is how we prepare for the Lord. And they have prepared and Jesus came. We are blessed and excited because our sins have been parted and God came. And so we look back as a beneficiary of Jesus coming. And so there's still for us a preparation today. There's still for us an obedience that God says, right? And in the story of the flood, just real quick, where was the Jesus figure? Where's the Jesus figure in the story of the flood? If we're to find the gospel and the Jesus figure in the story of the flood, where was that? Did you say rain? Noah? A dove, the boat. The boat saved people. The Jesus figure, the rescuer, the boat rescued a few. Scripture says the road to heaven is narrow, but to the world is wide. A few are saved. This boat was the salvation, redemption figure in that storyline. And so the Noah would be those who are like believers today, those who are deemed righteous, not by their works, but by their belief in God. And so the, the people saved would be the Noah and his family. And so here, there's a preparation for Noah. There's a preparation here through Isaiah. And there's a preparation for us today. And for those who are preparing, those who are Sabbathing and not just resting on a Sunday or whatever is a Sabbath day, but they're really using that day to share story of God, to remind themselves of, of the ark or remind themselves of creation or remind themselves of Jesus and taking advantage of pointing one another around Hanukkah and lighting of the candles and sharing stories of the miraculous things God has done. All of that continues to anchor us in him today. So when we experience modern day floods, whether it's cancer or health, whatever it might be, the loss of a job, the running out of money, whatever that is, when we experience that and we're anchored in Christ, we will have peace that surpasses all understanding because the world will look on and say, how? Why are you remaining faithful in this? How is that possible? And so there is peace for those who are anchored. So here's three things Jesus has done for us. If you want to ponder on stuff later on this afternoon, if you're lighting that fourth candle tonight at sundown, um, when you do that, you could reflect on these three things. Jesus has done plenty. He's done a ton. Like we could share like over 40 things Jesus has done. But here's three things Jesus has done. One is Jesus obeyed God perfectly for us. For each and every one of us, we can have peace when we feel like we're a failure, that I missed that opportunity, that I didn't do that, or I fell short with spending time with the Lord in my quiet time. I can have grace towards myself because Jesus had that quiet time this morning for you. That's the gospel. So Jesus obeyed God perfectly for us. The second thing, Jesus died instead of us. Jesus went to the cross for each and every one of us. And that is a beautiful thing Jesus has done. The third thing uh, Jesus has done is he sent his spirit for us to dwell within us. And that spirit, scripture says in Philippians, is the one that gives us a desire for God and that spirit is the one that gives us the power to please God. The Holy Spirit is amazing, an amazing gift from God. What's one thing that Jesus has yet done? What's one thing he has promised to do? He will come back. 
Jesus will come back for us. Thessalonians says it this way. I'll close after this. Oh, I put it on the screen. I have it on the screen. Thessalonians says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who die, who have died, will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. What in the world? Then we will be with the Lord forever. That is a beautiful promise of Jesus coming back. We experience peace in the midst of modern day floods because we're preparing. We're walking intimately with God, reminding ourselves of who God is and what God has done and what he plans to do. I can have peace when the, my future is uncertain because this is true. If you walk like Noah walked, trusting God, I trust you'll save my family. I trust you'll redeem this situation. It may not work out the way we have planned. We may even die physically, but this just happens instantaneous for us. And that's a beautiful promise. Jesus puts it this way in regards to people not preparing. There's a story in Luke chapter 12 of a, a rich man tearing down his barns and building bigger ones, if you guys remember that. And then Jesus says at the end of that passage, he says this, yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. A person is a fool who's living life, but not preparing, not having a rich anchored relationship with God. That's all that matters. Everything in Isaiah where it says the whole world, everything's gonna fade away. Our clothes, us, it's all gonna fade away. But what doesn't fade away is God and our spirit. We're gonna live forever if you have faith in Christ. Well, you're gonna live forever regardless if you have faith in Christ. It's just gonna be with him or not. So there you have it on that. I wanna encourage us to prepare for the Lord. I want to encourage us as we uh, celebrate Advent today, we will experience more peace when we go through modern day floods if we are walking with God intimately. It's not what saves us, but it's what allows us to have peace. Father, upon that word, we give you thanks. We know that uh, Jesus, your son, is our strength and our weakness. We know when we are tired, when we are weary, no matter how young we are, how much energy we have, we will fail. And uh, we press into you, Jesus. We give you thanks for your spirit within us. And we pray you would continue to draw us back to you as we walk, as we get distracted in life, as we fade away. I pray that you would continue to draw us back to you and you alone. We bless you, Lord. And I pray that through preparation, we all get a glimpse and experience the peace that surpasses all understanding. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.